that does not negate the importance of all the other issues. It's just a question of where do you pull the string out first to lead you to the next step. If there was one theme on the way forward uh, that we kept coming back to as a group was the issue of trust building. And in this sense, we were trying to approach it in all its different manifestations and dimensions. It was viewed, though, that um, we should not reach for the, for the big brass ring, if you will, that we should take small steps, not look at it for one big package that can solve all the issues. And part of this trust building is at the very core issues of understanding motivations of the individuals, understanding each other's narratives, and each have a very rich narrative based on facts, based on myth, but it is a narrative that is spoken quite often, and it's one that you have to reach out to. In particular, as part of this is to understand also the internal politics that are driving that narrative, that are driving the needs as, they, as each side reaches out to the other of what they want to achieve in some form of agreement. Israel needs to feel secure. Israel's fear of annihilation needs to be addressed. How do you make them feel more secure for reaching out, taking the risks as they view it for peace, pulling out of land in which they may find that that land could be used again to attack them? That's part of their narrative. The Palestinians are now in the process, particularly in the West Bank, of building a state. How far do we support that? How far do they go to building the state before they declare a state with all its benefits of citizenship, all its benefits that it will bring for its future and the way the people, uh, the Palestinians, think about themselves. In addition to that, the politics of the dynamics between Fatah and Hamas play an important role here. How do we help them bridge their divide? The group spent a lot of time on Hamas. And part of the story out of there is just simply the recognition that Hamas is not going away. Hamas is part of the story and somehow we have to deal with Hamas. And then somehow there's the other elements that Hamas brings, its own legitimacy, its ambition, its charter, which talks about the destruction of the state of Israel. Things that may need to change in order to continue to build trust. And how do you go about that process? And how much time do you give that process? The other element we talked about was how to rebuild the constituencies for peace. The middle group, the large group that keeps being polled, on the Palestinians and Israelis in particular, in which the majority basically say they believe in a two-day solution, they believe in a negotiated solution. And yet they may not be the dominant players here. The Peace Now movement in Israel is to the sidelines. How do you revitalize that? How do you revitalize a Peace Now group amongst the Palestinians? These, are, these were some of the questions that we were trying to grapple with in building trust. Turning a broader field to the issue of Israel-Syria, that discussion begins with the notion of saying that there's a recognition that the Israel-Palestinian issue is a core issue. Not to, it doesn't negate the importance of the Israel-Syrian agreement, it also, but it is a recognition that actually since 1974, Israel and Syria have had basically a non-conflict relationship. It doesn't negate each other's needs. But it is something that, it is something to be built upon. We never really had a full discussion of whether or not if we achieved an agreement between Israel and Syria now, if that could be a game changer with regard to the Israel-Palestinian talks. But this is another element perhaps for further discussion. We also did not spend a lot of time, but we could, if we had more time, discussing the issue between Israel and Lebanon. There was some discussion about the dynamics of the UN Resolution 1701, which basically helped uh, close the conflict between Israel and, Syria and Lebanon in 2006. There, was, there were claims and counterclaim, counterclaims about whether or not those agreements are being held up if everyone's respecting the resolution. Uh, clearly, there are a number of violations that could be brought forward in that area. Next, we turn to the international support for a peace process. Um, in this regard, it was viewed that the United States' support for this is critical. 
but it's not sufficient. And so the thought had to, we had discussed quite a bit, who else is a player here? And one, of the, one of the countries that we focused a lot on was the issue of Turkey. That Turkey had been a player, has been a growing player, is it now growing economic power in that part of the world? That the states in the region have more trade with Turkey? At the same time, in light of, in, in, in full fact, in light of the, uh, the recent flotilla event and crisis, Turkey needs now to spend more time building its trust relationship with Israel if it's going to truly try to be a broker in it, a trusted broker. Michael, can I cut in there and just ask you to, to sort of approach okay. to wrap it up? Thank you. Okay. Um, we talked about the need about bringing in other Arab states as part of this process. We talked about the idea of having restarting some form of regional negotiations that bring in all the players that have a vested interest, or at least invite all the players to come to the table. Um, we also talked about the need to perhaps develop a five-year vision plan, something that can raise people's horizons about the way of the future and where this all this process may be leading. And we also talked about how the international community basically has to help, if you will, stiffen the spines, give greater confidence to the leaders in the region themselves so that they are willing to take the compromises and the risks necessary for actually moving the process ahead and make the, uh, and basically support some type of process under a leadership that's more international in focus. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, moving on to, from a sort of area of long-standing difficulty to something more recent and, and something which is on our radars and, and, and increasingly important and will be reflected in the, the panels tomorrow. Um, the next, the topic of the next group was Somalia and the Global Jihad, which was chaired by my colleague uh, from King's College London, Dr. Randolph Kent, who is Director of the Humanita Humanitarian Futures Programme at the Department of War Studies. And can I just ask Randolph and, and the last two chairmen to, to keep it to sort of five minutes? Thank you. Fine. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Chair. I'm sure we can summarize Somalia and its problems and ways ahead in five minutes. It, uh, that said, let me just say that uh, one of the fascinating things is that we, you had organized a workshop with real experts, and I think we had real expert discussion. What I think was our intention was to say, with all this expertise around the room, given the problems of Somalia, global jihad, radicalization, etc., where would you, after years of dealing with Somalia, what sorts of policy prescriptions would you offer? So with that in mind, we spent a large part of our time trying to address what does policy prescription look like? One of the fascinating things is the coherence and the consistent themes of the panel so far in our policy prescriptions. That said, let me begin with the underlying assumption, and that is that one can erode the prospect of Somali radicalization and jihadism. In so doing, one will have to look for new ways of engagement. And that led us to perhaps seven policy prescriptions. The first one was the, what is called the transitional federal government of Somalia, or the 14th attempt by the international community to develop a government in Somalia, needs to be reconsidered. Not in terms of intention, necessarily, but in terms of with whom do we dialogue? Who, with whom do we engage? And in this sense, two sub-solutions came to the panel's mind. The first one was, what we need to do is to be more effectively reactive. What does that mean? That given all the problems that one knows and understands about Somalia, the fact of the matter is, there are pockets of good governance. There are pockets of effectiveness. How do we expand that? How should we actually begin to promote that? 